Hi there, come on in. You know, we've been spending the past couple of weeks showing you some of our caribou adventure up in the Arctic, up in the tundra of northern Quebec. Well, this is the finale. My encounter with that record book caribou. Does Fred Trost have all of the ability and skill of Fred Bear? Well, you're gonna find out the answer to that in just a moment. <laughs> I don't think you'd be too surprised, but stay tuned, it's Thursday night. I'm Fred Trost, it's time for Michigan Outdoors. We spent six days on the tundra of northern Quebec. Desolate country, but beautiful country. Ungava Bay to the north marks the land where the caribou roam. They migrate in the fall to wintering grounds, crossing many lakes and rivers that meander throughout the tundra. But they go right over the bank. In fact, here's some fresh tracks. Probably made not too long ago. Some fresh tracks leading right up. They come right up through those rocks. Rather incredible, they're crossing from the other side over there. They come right through all these rocks and swim across this river, this current. Now why they don't pick their way through the shallower water, I don't know. The caribou don't avoid the rapids. It wasn't far from these waters where thousands died during the great North American floods in the fall of 1986. Putting meat on the table with a bow and arrow is not a simple task. Ptarmigan are grouse-like birds of the tundra. After chasing a flock, my tenth shot was the closest. We had spaghetti for dinner that night. Our quarry was caribou, and although I wasn't after a trophy with a bow and arrow, I certainly was thrilled to see huge bulls walking on the ridges. This bull I watched from a distance, but I couldn't get any closer than 80 or 90 yards. I did have a moment of excitement when two young bulls ran about 40 yards from me and I got a shot. If you get close to your TV screen, you can probably see the white fletching on my arrow as it glides just over the neck of this bull. My most exciting moment came one morning when I least expected it. You guys won't believe it. John and I left to go over that knoll to the north, yeah. or whatever it is over there. And there's a little pothole there. And there's a caribou, a big caribou. Dead. I'm not kidding, no, no. I mean with massive antlers. You're laying down? I'm, no, it was feeding along around the edge of this. Uh, my heart's pounding, I said, John, John, you know, just stay right here. Somewhere as it was feeding around, it looked and stopped. bull spotted us as we jockeyed for a better angle. The wind was perfect, blowing from the huge bull right towards us, but their eyes pick up movements in the trees. They're looking for wolves. I cautioned John Ford not to move whatever he did, but somehow I knew it was already too late. You can't imagine how my heart was pounding. A record book caribou, probably only 50 yards away, coming towards us. The camera is rolling, and he spotted us. But wait, if we hold perfectly still, he might calm down and continue walking around this little bog. So let's keep extremely still and quiet. Our hopes of a close range 20 yard shot, which would have been a sure thing, are now dashed. The bull is spooked. But maybe the encounter isn't over. 
I saw a movie Howard Shelley did on the original Michigan Outdoors show back in 1969. He showed an Indian guide raising his arms to imitate the antlers of another large caribou. And in his film, the big bull actually came towards the Indian guide and the camera to get a better look. If I stepped out into the open and raised my arms like I saw in Howard Shelley's film, would this big bull hold still or even come back to me? the caribou starts to circle, actually coming in for a closer look. Howard Shelley's film taught me well, but with my heart pounding, could I judge the distance and make an accurate shot? It looked to me like 35 or 40 yards, almost out of range. My arrow was on its way. In slow motion, you can see it against the sky at the top of its arc. But watch the caribou start to run before the arrow gets there. I saw the arrow land by the caribou's back leg. That ended four and a half minutes of the highest suspense I've ever had while hunting. A camera rolling behind my shoulder, a record book caribou making its way towards me, soon to be within 20 yards, finally the long shot that missed but not by much so did i ever get a caribou well of course everybody filled their two permits on the last afternoon of the last day i took two average sized caribou with a rifle but i was going for meat so i was happy we had all kinds of tales to tell in caribou camp but the one experience that i'll relive time and time again was when i imitated a bull's antlers with my arms and actually got that bull to come back almost within range. That's a great story, don't you agree? Terry Walters of Taylor caught this 10 pound, 10 ounce walleye on a jig and minnow fishing the Detroit River. And here's a great eating fish, a 7 pound, 11 ounce burbot that Helen Holman of Rapid City caught in Grand Traverse Bay on a jig. Buck Smith of Muskegon got this 18 and a half pound steelhead on spawn fishing the Muskegon River. It was 34 and a half inches long. And here's a Wisconsin viewer, Mark Millsop of Green Bay. He took an 11 point elk in Sweetgrass, Montana. Jeff Taylor of Homer hung in there to take this 12 point buck on the fifth day of the gun season in Calhoun County. Susan Smith of Williamsburg was all alone in her spearing shanty on Skagamog Lake when this monster muskie came through. It went for her decoy. She took good aim and released the spear. The rest is history, as they say, and Susan had a 49 and a half inch, 35 pound, six ounce muskie. Well, for making a good shot on a trophy of a lifetime, let's make Susan Smith, our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Muskie Angler of the Week. The Natural Resources Commission is expected to okay a plan to drop the salmon and trout limit in Lake Michigan to no more than three of each species, except lake trout, which will continue to have a limit of two. The total limit of trout and salmon together will remain at five. Representative Jerry Bartnick of Monroe County will introduce a bill to split off the environmental functions of the Department of Natural Resources. He says the current DNR structure shortchanges hunters and fishermen. Consumers Power has donated $20,000 to a Mason County group for a walleye rearing pond which is expected to create a large-scale walleye fishery in the Ludington area. Handgunner Larry Kelly has been inducted into the Safari Club International Hall of Fame. Kelly invented the magnaporting process to reduce recoil and firearms and is the founder of Handgun Hunters Museum in Mount Clemens. DNR biologists are trapping and transplanting nuisance wild turkeys in Menominee County. The birds apparently flew from across the river from Wisconsin and are causing Michigan crop farmers lots of headaches. Thanks.
The new DNR director is sending out some signals to DNR employees that could significantly change the future course of the DNR. According to the Lansing State Journal, David Hales told a group of outdoor writers that just because a person isn't a hunter or an angler, it doesn't make any difference in that person's ability to lead the DNR. I don't agree. Back in 1974, duck hunting might have been totally banned nationally if professional biologist Ed Mikula and other duck hunting biologists didn't pitch in to defend it. And what if Howard Tanner didn't have a personal love of Great Lakes fishing? Would he have fought as hard for the salmon program? Ralph McMullen, Harry Rule, and many others were effective DNR leaders because they loved and participated in hunting and fishing. It's too bad our new DNR director poo-poos this type of personal involvement. It's the one ingredient that could turn a competent professional into an inspiring leader. W.J. Terry from Jackson is looking towards summer and he says, I hope to buy a new boat, but I wonder if a smaller boat, say a 14-footer, would be safe to use on a larger lake such as Houghton Lake. What about the Great Lakes? Well, Terry, it all depends on when and how you plan to use it. Now, a canoe is fine even on the Great Lakes under these conditions. If the water is calm, skies are blue, weather forecast is stable, if there's plenty of daylight left, lots of other boats around, you have life preservers and safety equipment on hand, and you'd be able to make it back to shore in short order if a storm blew up. A big boat lets you handle rough water, but small boats can get you fishing on big lakes if you don't push your luck. There's a snow fest running Friday through Sunday at Cedarville. Also Friday through Sunday, the Alpena Chamber of Commerce holds its winter carnival, and the Muskegon Steelheaders hold their boat and fishing show at the L.C. Walker Arena. Saturday, the Hillman Area Fishing Association is sponsoring a festival at the Fletcher Floodwaters. All weekend at Midland, an invitational wildlife art show takes place at the Holiday Inn Conference Center. The Detroit Boat Show and International Fishing Exposition runs through Sunday at Gobo Hall. Fred Trost, Kathy Beitler, and I will be at the Central Michigan Michigan Sports Show this weekend. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll be doing seminars on deer and turkey hunting and walleye fishing along with cooking demonstrations. The event takes place at the Lansing Civic Center. This weekend at Fred Trost Hunting and Fishing Museum, Big Buck Night 88, and the Fishing Awards Banquet of 88 videos will run continuously. The museum is on Old 27, one block north of the State Police Post at Houghton Lake. The Stroh's Fishing Awards Banquet is on tap for Friday, February 24th, and the Stroh's Hunting Awards Awards Banquet takes place the next night, Saturday, February 25th. Tickets are still available for each event. On Saturday, we'll think spring and hold our annual fishing workshop. Experts will be on hand from all over the state, teaching you how to put more fish on the line in 89. And if you missed a number, you can get it by calling the Michigan Travel Bureau toll-free on Friday during working hours. It's not a trophy by trophy book standards. It's a cow caribou, an average size cow. But to me, oh, was I proud. After six long, hard days of hunting, and I mean six days, I took this caribou in the last two hours of the last day of the hunt. Borrowed a rifle and put some meat in the freezer with two caribou. This mount was done by Tim Hayes of the Michigan Taxidermist Association. Very realistic mount, and, and I think they're beautiful animals. Boy, someday if I get a white-tailed deer with antlers this size, I would be absolutely thrilled. But as far as caribou go, they're commonplace. I'm going to get a lot of questions from people who say, where did you go? Who do you book through? How do I do a caribou hunt like that? Well, there's never any guarantees in hunting and fishing, but there are lots of good outfitters throughout Canada and throughout Quebec. We booked through Safari Nordique, a man named Henry Popart from Quebec, uh, from up in Montreal, and you saw the kind of hunt we had, and that's typical of the hunts up in that country. Let's take a look at this mount. You know how, how caribou differ from white-tailed deer is interesting. Their nose, from what our experience was that it just is not used as much as a white-tailed deer in detecting danger. Another difference in the nose, the physical difference, it's all covered with hair. Hair completely over the muzzle of a caribou, and this is naturally bare on a white-tailed deer. The eyes, big, bulging, protruding eyes seem very important to caribou. I, I don't know how well they see, but they sure detect motion the same way a wild turkey does. Their ears, not particularly large, in fact, very small compared to a white-tailed deer's ears, and they don't seem to rely on their ears to listen for danger up on the tundra. 
antlers are an interesting part of caribou. Of course, this is in the velvet. The velvet is actually relatively long hair. Reminds me of rabbit hair. It's long and it's thick. And all of the caribou that are taken during the hunts up at that time of year are in the velvet. This mount will be on display at the Central Michigan Sports Show this weekend. Of course, Bob, Kathy, and I will be there along with videos that you've seen the past three weeks of our caribou adventure. Besides these videos from Quebec, we're going to have a number of Michigan Outdoors shows at the Central Michigan Sports Show. Bob Garner and I will be doing seminars each day, well, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We're going to do two each, each day on white-tailed deer. <laughs> I'm not doing any on caribou, but we're going to have that video in the booth on shooting. Bob is going to do them on wild turkey hunting as well as walleye fishing. Now, back at the booth, we've got something new we're going to try. Kathy Beitler, you've seen her prepare her recipes every week on the show. She's going to be preparing and giving away tastes of venison. A lot of different techniques she'll be using from our cookbooks. And this is going to be something new we're trying in the sports show. Another thing that they're doing down here this year, kids are free. So kids can come to the sports show free, and they can fish in the trout pond for a reduced rate. The first 1,000 kids that come and fish in the trout pond, whether they get a trout or not, are going to get a spool of trilene line for free. So it's going to be quite a deal at the sports show. Uh, we're going to be there, like I said, all weekend. People ask us, how many appearances like this do we do throughout the year? Because of our national TV show coming up, which we're going to start that version in April, we just don't have time for these appearances. The next time we're going to be uh, in the public eye, I guess, will be at our Fishing and Hunting Awards Banquets, which come up at the end of February, the 24th and 25th at the Lansing Civic Center. The Fishing Banquet, this, uh, like the Hunting Banquet, will attract probably 125 Stroh's Fishing Award winners. They'll be on stage telling their tales. We have a great meal. And some of the stories you hear from the anglers on stage, well, Last year, I remember one that was a classic, talking about the ice conditions we have and the thin ice this year. Listen to this story. Richard Woodruff from Beaverton was fishing with the shiner on a tip-up and the, oh, a Christmas shiner. Yeah. A I, Christmas tip. <clears throat> I planked out uh, on the ice. The ice was only about a half inch thick. You should, we'll run these pictures in the trophy book. You got to look at this. What do you mean you planked out? Well, I got uh, a dock um, suspended out 20 feet, and then right off the end of the dock, I put out some uh, four-foot planks that I walked out on to get my line out so I got deep enough water. And uh, I don't know, it was uh, Christmas Day. We usually go out with the family for Christmas, and our, my kids had chicken pox. We stayed home and put the tip up out in front of the house, and my daughter saw the flag come up. I said, Dad, the flag's up, so I ran outside, and there it was, 25-pounder. Now... This ice is how thick did you say? It was about a half inch thick. It's a picture right here. Oh, I'm not kidding. You look at you can see. <sighs> he put a couple planks out towards the hole so he could shuffle out. Now you're out there, and I don't know what you weigh, probably 180, 190, something like that. About 190 pounds. 190 pounds, and now pulling that pike through, you're up to about 215. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't that make you a little nervous? Yeah, it was pretty nervous, yeah. <laughs> I got a couple more pictures there that uh the wife told me I couldn't bring. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I was standing there going like this after I caught it. N not too much more bragging, you know. I did enough <laughs> bragging already. <laughs> I guess. Well, I'll tell you, you, you risked yourself for that one. Congratulations. What a story. Wait till you see these pictures in the trophy book. Oh, what stories we have at our Fishing and Hunting Awards banquets. This year, February 24th and 25th at the Lansing Civic Center. Friday night is our Fishing Awards banquet. Saturday night, the Hunting Awards banquet. Yes, we have plenty of tickets. We're only about halfway sold out for both banquets. Call them in. Send them in. Uh, we should be able to accommodate you if you get it in in the next week or two. Everybody's invited. You don't have to be a trophy award winner. Now, our trophy award winners do show up, bring their mounts, and they have them on display. Uh, they come up on stage where we tape our TV trophy book interviews for the entire year. So it's kind of fun to watch and to be a part of. As far as a meal, ho oh, ho, don't eat in the afternoon because we have a phenomenal meal. Coils of Houghton Lake caters 
uh, carved beef and chicken and all, all the food you can eat and it's a tremendous feed. It's also a tremendous program. In fact, I have this caribou right there on the trophy board with the rest of the big trophies. So if you can get plans, get a group together, come on down and join us at these banquets. We have a great time. If you are harling in Europe, what are you fishing for? Harling is a method of trolling where the boat drifts downstream at the same speed as the lure, similar to drift boat fishing in the United States. Harling is popular in Scandinavian countries for Atlantic salmon and in Chile for trout. Tom Bokes from Rochester Hills, your recipe has inspired Bob Garner to fly. Actually, Kathy Beitler prepared your venison roast with a chunk of caribou that I brought back from the tundra. Oh, it looks excellent, too. It's just perfect for this recipe. You're going to salt it and then make a marinade out of baking soda and water. And what it actually does is just tenderizes the meat. Baking soda? Baking soda, soda. And right. So it's it like works. a Mr. Wizard science experiment. <laughs> I've never heard of, of using this as a oh, marinade. Oh, sure, yeah. They use it quite a bit. And it, it really huh. does tenderize the meat just naturally. Well, caribou is so tender anyway. It's so succulent and tasty. Well, I hope this doesn't... Oh, this doesn't ruin it doesn't at ruin all. It? No, okay. and that's why the baking soda doesn't give any extra flavor to it. And you're going to pan it off when it, after you let it set in the marinade for seven to eight hours with paper towel and then put your pats of butter on it and garlic powder and pepper. And you don't need any extra salt here because it's in your Mrs. Grass onion soup and everything is right I in suppose you can one use, little package. You could use any brand of onion soup. Oh, sure you, you could. That's sure. just what Tom Boach recommends. That's right. And then we're going to add extra onions here. He says they're great on it, and mm -hmm. they really are. And then wrap it all up in aluminum foil. So you have a pot roast, basically. Exactly. A venison, in this case, caribou. Oh, my favorite. My favorite venison type of meat. And once it comes out and the juices are there, you're just going to add sour cream to the broth to make a gravy. And here goes Bob Garner. Freddie, I hate to fly. I mean, <laughs> I you, know you, you, can't, fly. you can't pay me, threaten me, or whatever to get an airplane. To have meat like this, Freddie... And this mm. recipe, I would probably get in the smallest airplane <laughs> and fly anywhere. This is great. This is not like the venison we it usually eat. No. It's tender. It's, it's a, nice. It, it tastes like about the finest, in some ways, corned beef you could ever you could ever buy. I it love has the, it. The, the long texture. filaments. Yeah, I think the texture is the tenderest red meat I've ever oh, had. Yeah. Well, they eat lichen up there, and they're they're lean. Mm -hmm. oh, Definitely, but not like our venison or or beef. It's but the recipe, good. recipe's good oh, too, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we forgot about the recipe. This caribou is so good. Fred, not everybody can get caribou, but they ought to try this with corned beef or whatever. This is, <laughs> this is absolutely what, folks, a knockout. I almost didn't get caribou. It was that close. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you did. <laughs> hey, you talk on right, and I'm glad they eat lichen too. This is great. <laughs> All the ingredients for tonight's recipe, in case you didn't write them down, are in the January-February issue of our Outdoor Digest magazine. The Outdoors Forever section has ideas for lifelong hunting and fishing. The show pages contain the mailbags and quizzes. A calendar of Outdoors Club events features the museum and our fishing workshop, along with an entry form and rules for the Stroh's Hunting and Fishing Awards. Plus, articles on hunting knives, the world of wildlife art, and rifling's effect on bullets by shooting expert Jim Carmichael. For the January-February issue... Boy, you think I had some rough luck bow hunting for caribou? Can you imagine being a weatherman for this past winter? Oh, man, our guides have been telling us around the state, well, they don't know what to say from week to week. Look at our deer severity index. It looked like it was going to go way ahead of last year, but so far it seems comparable. In the Upper Peninsula, 45, 50 last year, 42 this year, 48 last year in the different areas. Same thing in the northern lower, comparable conditions. If this holds, and who knows whether it will, uh, the deer should make it through the winter in good shape. As far as snow goes, as of Wednesday night, last night, not much in the southern part of the state, 12 inches in the northern western part of the lower peninsula we're looking at 18 inches uh, on the east side of the up 30 inches in the west plenty for snowmobiling and rabbit hunting has been pretty fair our ice conditions well in the upper peninsula 24 inches in lake gogibic bay de knock minuskong bay down to 10 18 18 inches in houghton lake otherwise about a foot of ice and in the very southern part it has been unsafe but it should be back safe again by this weekend take a look at our fishing well, lake trout limits in the Keweenaw Peninsula. 
cold front has kind of messed things up. Uh, walleye, most we can come up with is two to three walleye, maybe running two to three pounds in most of the areas of the state. Haven't heard about any limits. Limits of bluegill and Houghton Lake, eight to nine inches. Uh, steelhead have been kind of skimpy. Perch running six to eight inches in the lower peninsula, although we have some reports of 14 inches up at Drummond Island. Uh, suckers are starting in the southwest, by the way. What about this weekend? We're going to be at the Central Michigan Sports Show. Drop in if you're an Outdoors Club member. It's a dollar off on admission. Otherwise, get outdoors if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. I'll tell you, that was the thrill of my life. Standing up there so close to that record book caribou. Isn't that something how my luck stays consistent? didn't mar my unblemished record of not getting a record book buck or a record book caribou. I had a great time anyway. I hope you enjoyed this series along with me. Next week, we're going to swing back into some Michigan action with some walleye fishing, some winter walleye, bring back some tasty treats for the table. So join me next week right here on PBS. <laughs>